Welcome to City Cinematheque, where the art and pleasure of the movies are the subject of serious discussion. I'm your host, Jerry Carlson, and I teach film studies at the City College of the City University of New York. Today, it's our pleasure to present the 1938 film, The Lady Vanishes, directed by Alfred Hitchcock. This is the last of the great films that Hitchcock made in England before coming to Hollywood. It's also one of the films that sets the formula of adventure, mystery, romance. Those three elements are woven together into an exquisite fabric uh, in this particular film. Now, joining us today after the screening will be Charlotte Chandler. She's the author of a recent biography, It's Only a Movie, Alfred Hitchcock, a personal biography. So we'll be talking about the film as well as about the adventure, you might say, of writing a biography of Alfred Hitchcock. Now, enjoy the many pleasures of The Lady Vanishes. Well, welcome back to City Cinematheque. Uh, we will not have a quiz as to whether or not you can hum the tune. Uh, but what we will do for the next 30 minutes is we'll chat about this film and more generally about uh, Hitchcock. And who better to have with us than the author of the most recent biography and one with a distinct set of angles to it, our good friend Charlotte Chandler. Uh, the name of the biography is It's Only a Movie, Alfred Hitchcock. Uh, a personal biography. Uh, our viewers may know uh, Charlotte from her other work, her writings on uh, Groucho Marx, Federico Fellini, and Billy, Billy Wilder. Uh, welcome to City Cinema Tech, Charlotte. Thank you. I'm very happy to be here with you again. Great. Let's, let's talk about, just start out on uh, a, a phrase that may sort of open the doors to your book on this. You call this a personal biography of Hitchcock. Wh what do you mean by a personal biography? It's uh, my personal relationship with Alfred Hitchcock, and even more important, the personal relationships of those who knew him, who worked with him, of Alma Hitchcock, whom I've had the pleasure of meeting, Patricia Hitchcock, his daughter, the stars, James Stewart, Cary Grant, Ingrid Bergman, those who worked with him, Grace Kelly. Uh, the uh, whole experience, not just of stars, but of the technicians and some of the people who worked with him almost at the very beginning, even going back to silent films. And uh, I had the chance to meet Alfred Hitchcock late in his life, right. but in a very interesting way. Uh, I was in Paris and I was on my way to take some classes in Spain to perfect my Spanish. <laughs> and I stopped in Paris and I went to the Cinémathèque Française because I was tremendously interested in films. And this is before I'd ever written anything. Right. And there I was uh, with Henri Langlois, to whom I had an introduction, and he asked me what I would like to see. And I said I would like to see the early films of Alfred Hitchcock, because in London I had the chance at the British Film Institute to see some, and I wanted to see more. And so he showed me these films, and while I was watching them, he came in and he said, and how would you like to have dinner with Alfred Hitchcock? <laughs> so, that was oh, a bad day in Paris, I bet. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I thought he was joking. And I said, oh, of course, I'd love to. And he said, tonight, 7 o'clock, at the Plaza Athenay Hotel. Can you make it? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Short, uh, short, short answer to that. So did you, uh, on, on that first encounter, did you start thinking about how this might develop into a book, or is this something that came later? Because one of the things about this book is it's so multi-perspectival. That is, we get, uh, we get so many people's observations about their experience of, 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 of Hitchcock. I mean, there's just so many people who had contact with Hitchcock whom you interviewed or, or, or met. Well, I love your perception of exactly what I hope to do because I really wanted it to represent all of these people from people who were second assistant directors, people who were technicians going back as far as the silent film as well as the stars and my own. But when I was uh, meeting Alfred Hitchcock and his wife Alma, because Alma was extraordinary and a very important part of the films and of his life. And uh, she's frequently given credit, uh, for instance, on The Lady Vanishes, mm -hmm. she's continuity, but uh, Alfred Hitchcock made it clear 
that she was much more important than that. She was his muse. She was the person who helped him select the film. He never let anything go out that she didn't approve of. She was his best companion. And so I had the chance to talk with her, too. And yes, I was thinking about what I would write and what I would do. And uh, I was memorizing as best I could <laughs> while I was still trying to be present there and not totally not responsive because I was so busy memorizing. Right. But it was a wonderful experience, a great dinner. And the food was good, too. <laughs> <clears throat> So let's uh, let's talk. Uh, let's go just to the lady vanishes now, and then we'll fold out mm -hmm. more more generally. Because this is one of the things I said in my introduction to the film today is when you uh, if when you put together the the words adventure, mystery, romance, this is one of the films that sets the formula, and I mean that in a very positive way for how you can combine seamlessly all of those elements into you know what what we really think of as the movies, as, as the full set of pleasures uh, that, the movies, that, that the movies can give us. Who did you talk to <clears throat> about this film? Well, I was uh, especially lucky to talk with Roy Ward Baker, who was second assistant director. At a time when he said second assistant director didn't exist as a job, it was so low. <laughs> but it shaped his life, and he became an important British director who worked in America, too. And he learned so much from Hitchcock. But it was nice to be able to talk with someone who was actually there and who was watching and observing Hitchcock do all of this, as well as talking with Hitchcock. Hitchcock said to me about this film that uh, it's not a slice of life, it's a slice of cake. And uh, Lovely I, quote. I really like that a lot. And actually, uh, coming here, I was thinking about the people who are going to be watching this film for the first time. And I can't even imagine what it's like. I love it so much, having watched it many, many times. Uh, over several years, I've watched it. Now I watched it again for my film uh, appearances. I watched it for writing the book. I watched it for coming here. And every time I hear something new, I see something that delights me. But it's hard to go back and imagine what it was like that very first time. But uh, Roy Ward Baker told me kind of an interesting image which has stayed with me and which I like, which isn't actually in the film. It's something that happened. And he remembers Alfred Hitchcock bringing his little daughter, Patricia Hitchcock, to the set. And he was very, very proud of her all his life. He was extremely proud of her. And she acted in his films and in television. And uh, she was a little girl. And they had lunch on the train. <laughs> and he had a hamper of food from Fortnum & Mason, the looks uh, elegant store that sold the greatest food in London. And uh, they had a bottle that looked like a bottle of champagne, but it was really some kind of bubbly fruit juice. And uh, they had uh, everything set up with silver and linen to look like a very special dinner. And Roy Ward Baker always remembered Alfred Hitchcock and the picture through the window of him with his little daughter uh, doing that. And actually, Alfred Hitchcock always liked crystal and linen and silver and made a great experience mm. out of every meal. And I was lucky enough to go from the Plaza Athene to uh, see him more times in Paris, to be in his home, and to share these occasions and have him talk with me about what it was like, even when he was a boy, how much he relished the meal and felt that it should be given a very special occasion, and how important it was with Alma that they shared their talks about all of the films they made over lengthy meals, sometimes three and three and a half hours, just the two of them, with wine and the meal that she cooked. She was a great cook. Oh, but but you know that's a very interesting. <clears throat> it's a very interesting set of set of facts because uh, not only does it give us you know a, a, an image of, of of Hitchcock, further humanizes him, takes him a little bit away from you know the performances he gave us in his films and uh, and on the TV show in which he was with so many of the droll black humor jokes but also this whole notion of of uh, put put just simply as possible cooking up something that is uh, the, the whole notion of staging something sequencing something for a set of pleasures in a row and doing it you know by controlling all of the elements because there is an analogy to be made between you know the gigantic industrial task of making uh, a feature film 
and the more domestic task, but n nonetheless, um, you know, a task that requires multiple skills. Hmm. What is, you know, what is the quality of your tablecloth? How are you arranging your, what, what sequence? If you're having this wine with the first course, what wine should follow that? So it all is of a, of a, of a certain piece. You, you can, you, it sort of reveals a whole set of continuities uh, in Hitchcock's life and, and personality. Exactly true. When he was making a film at the studio, first break, usually at lunchtime, he would call Alma and they would discuss the menu for that night, what she was preparing, what she'd shop for, and what she would be serving. And he was very careful to try to be there on time for dinner so that everything was perfect. And he loved to be in control of every aspect of his life. And he was because he was such a great technical mind. And not only a brilliant imagination, a wonderful conversationalist, really a writer, and with tremendous visual images, but he loved to also think about everything technical in advance. And he made these storyboards, which showed every shot. And people said he saw the film in his mind, and he frequently said it too, that he saw the entire film in his mind before he did it. Though, uh, actually, Roy Ward Baker, who was the second assistant director at the time, said it was a leg pull, and that he really <laughs> only saw 75% of it. But you know, you, the, it's such an interesting um, notion because most people agree that a, a film is made three times. Uh, it's it's made in the script and the script in pre-production. It's made in the production when you're actually shooting it, and it's made in the in, in the editing room. In a certain sense, the you know, it's almost like three editions of a book. Uh, we have three opportunities to to tweak it, to reproportion it, do whatever you do, do, whatever you need to do. But there, uh, within the history of, of cinema, there are directors who prefer one version of that script versus another. That is, that they're most comfortable with controlling uh, the the picture in one stage or another. And the, and the great sort of contrast here would be somebody like Hitchcock, or you know, somebody like, like Lang probably as well. Who, Billy Wilder bi too. Absolutely. These people who, for them, it's all in this first stage. That you, 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 you should know everything you're doing here. And the other two stages, the actual production and shooting and the editing, or the execution of a master, of a master plan. You have all of the architect's plans and like you know, when you're building a house or building a building, obviously you have to adapt to certain of the conditions that that are unforeseeable in the master in the master plan. That's part of such a complicated task. But it doesn't mean that you deviate from the master plan so much. You just you just adapt in certain kinds of ways. Whereas other people, with somebody like like Jean Luc Godard being the extreme example on the other end, where People don't know really what the film is about you know, during pre 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 production. Uh, he gives uh, you know just gives notes to actors on the day they show up. They haven't seen any kind of, of script, and then it all sort of gets composed in the editing room. Uh, in the editing room, there, Hitchcock, Wilder, Lang are like the opposite of that. That they're, they're the, the people who want the control over that first uh, over that first stage, and certainly. Uh, it shows up in the best of all possible ways in something like uh, the Lady Vanishes, in which film students today, I mean, this this uh, this is this can watch this frame by frame because the relationship between every shot in this film with the following shot is thought out. I mean, it is an encyclopedia of film uh, of storytelling and film technique. This film. I feel that too, it's truly perfect. And Alfred Hitchcock would be appalled by making it up, Commedia dell'arte, as she went along. And indeed, he'd been working for quite a while before he came to this film. He'd been a silent film director. He'd been a talky film director. And uh, he knew what he was doing. And I agree, you can watch this no matter how many times you watch it, it's perfect. Right, and one of the people who discovered uh, the method of Hitchcock that you uh, you interviewed for, for, for the book is is Michael Redgrave because this was his first important film film role. Uh, how did what, what uh, tell us a little bit about what 
uh, Redgrave thought about uh, working with Hitchcock, what his experience was, was well, like? To begin with, he didn't think much about it at all. <laughs> he said yes. He was kind of sorry after he said yes that he said yes. And he considered himself a man of the theater. So his friends in the theater looked down on acting in the films, and he did. And he didn't take it too seriously. And also, he was working hard at the time. He was in a play on the London stage every night, Three Sisters. And he was putting his heart and soul into that performance and giving it everything, so he was always tired. And he came to the set, and he actually felt bored by what he was doing. He wasn't used to sitting around. He was used to a lot more encouragement than Hitchcock gave. Hitchcock cast the people because he had confidence in them. He felt they were right for the part. They were the best he could find. They knew what they were doing. He respected them. And because he did, he didn't encourage them a lot, and he didn't tell them what to do. And many of them kind of resented that. They were used to being uh, told how wonderful they were. They were used to praise. They were used to a lot of help and guidance. He didn't feel they needed that. He just wanted them to match the shots. Mm -hmm. And so uh, Michael Redgrave was there, and uh, Paul Lucas, who is the villain in the picture, right. uh, said to him that he'd been to see him in Three Sisters. And he was thrilled by the performance. But he felt that he wasn't coming to the film to give his all. And he asked him about it. He said, don't you realize once it's in the can, you can't ever do it again. And this is forever. And uh, it was something Michael Redgrave took to heart. He said he greatly appreciated what uh, Paul Lucas had said to him. And he took it much more seriously and had a different attitude, although he's consistently wonderful in the film. No, you don't see any, you don't see any change. I tried in the, to it, see it. Yeah. And I said to him, do you remember where? He said, very early. And I said, did you shoot all the scenes in order? He said, just about. <laughs> and I couldn't get him to tell me where it changed. So I think what changed wasn't so much his performance as his attitude and the feeling he had toward it. But what really changed was when he saw the film as a much older man. And he looked at the film, and he was stunned. He said what he most noticed was how young he looked. <laughs> and then he thought about it, and he said, and it's forever. Right. Right, that's right. And what one must say that, uh, uh, as he says in, in, in the book, it, it's one of those things that a, a, a stage actor may not have thought about, many others did not think about, um, in the 1930s when there was considerable tension between the, the serious craft of acting for the theater and this frivolity called, um, called the movies, uh, the notion of the preservation of performance, not, 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 of, not of age. And so we know a 16-year-old right now, seeing this for the first time, can see the artistry of uh, Michael Redgrave as an actor, and not only embodying this, but just a general artistry of him, because it's preserved. It's preserved forever. The uh, stars didn't realize, all of them universally, they all said to me, they never realized how many years later people would be watching their films. And certainly Alfred Hitchcock never realized that we would be sitting here in the 21st century right. and we would be seeing this film in a beautiful print of it right. and admiring the work that he did and the other people did. It's something quite extraordinary. Film preservation is so important. Well, uh, actually, uh, I had a very interesting experience a year or so ago up at uh, City College. We had a, 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 a young uh, French director of considerable uh, talent, uh, Cédric Capliche, was visiting, giving a master class to our students, and we, of course, had uh, several of his films, so he could show uh, he could show scenes um, uh, from them, and we went went through the class, and obviously he said, "No, but you know, I'd like to show something else," and he named one of his films, and I said, "You know, Cédric, I'm sorry, we don't happen to have that film." He said, "Oh, that's not a problem." Went over to his knapsack. Mm -hmm pulled out, you know, his uh, little thing, which I thought was his CDs. And there was the DVDs of all of his films. So he came in and says, oh, this is uh, code free, so let's put this in. And I think that's the click, that's the fourth one. So that sense that this is um, a durable and portable art, uh, art form in the manner that, you know, f for the last several hundred years, you could take a book anywhere with you. You could, you could preserve the book, etc. Now we have that with uh, someone like, like, like Hitchcock, that these works of such, uh, such artistry um, are readily available. 
uh, to all us. all exist except for the mountain eagle. So if anyone listening at this moment <laughs> has the mountain eagle or knows its whereabouts, we're all looking. Yeah, ex uh, ex exactly the case. Now, uh, let's, let's talk a little bit about maybe some of the surprises in, uh, in doing this, what I call multi-perspectival portrait of Hitchcock. By the way, I, I wanted to say one further thing about that, and that is that, you know, H Hitchcock was a master of presenting himself, and in so many ways he controlled, you know, press, uh, the, the press and how he would be pre presented. I mean, that's what actually one of his contributions is the way in which he created an image of himself, not only great films, but an image of himself that he wished to have presented. But there's a slight disadvantage to that, that, that you, you, much of what you can see of, of, of Hitchcock through a lot of other things is through the tunnel constructed by Hitchcock. What, what was um, interesting and surprising to you by talking to all of these other people? One of the things that was most interesting was to find the man behind the films, because all of these films are Alfred Hitchcock. They couldn't have been made by anyone else. They're his pictures. And this image from television, which he adored, he loved yeah. playing that character. And what he liked about it was that he wasn't that character. He didn't make up those lines. They were written for him. And he did all of them, and he found them wonderful and very funny. But he felt that to go out as himself would be like going out naked. And so he was glad to have this sort of cape to put on, and he enjoyed it. But because he did it, and because he made the kind of picture that he mostly did, it created what I thought was a kind of false impression, where many people would say to me, wasn't he really a monster? Wasn't he perverse? Uh, the image of him as a practical choker who didn't understand the practical choke and did the impractical choke, which was at the expense of the person. Uh, all of the ideas people had who'd never had the fun of meeting him, which I had, and it was fun, uh, would say these things to me. And I wanted it to be clear that this was a very kind, humane, <laughs> brilliant, <laughs> charming man who was really very good to people and didn't wish to do anyone any harm. But he was so good at this kind of picture. And I think that with a lot of the famous people, that the image we have of the stars is the character they played over and over right. and over. We see Betty Davis as the person she was in those films more than as the person she really was. And the same is true for Cary Grant, for Ingrid Bergman. Some of them were quite like the image. Others were less like it. Alfred Hitchcock was less like the image presented by his films and on television. But it was a lot of fun, and everybody enjoyed it. But Telly Savalas, the late Telly Savalas, told a story about how that shaped his life. Uh, it was very amusing, because before he became the lovable Kojak, he had, he had been most successful in playing psychopaths. And so he said he got trapped in a in a big traffic jam one day in L.A., and everybody was out of their cars, et cetera. And he said, all of a sudden, he realized that everybody was scared of him because he was standing outside of his car, and it had to be that psychopath they'd seen on, on the screen. He said, no, 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 I'm just a guy trapped in the traffic jam, just like, yeah. uh, just like you are. And I think, uh, yeah. you know, Hitchcock, in, in that one sense, has been a victim of his own success Absolutely. in creating this you know, self-protective image of himself as the ironic, black humor, um, practical joker. But I have a traffic jam story about him told to me by his daughter, Patricia. And uh, she said that his granddaughters would go out with him, and they would be in the car, and that people would wave at him and scream, and they would all be calling out. And his joke was, he'd say to the granddaughters, you're very popular. <laughs> but he really loved that success, which the television brought to him. Now, the cameo appearances in his films brought some, and his uh, appearances generally a bit but nothing like television. Right. That really did it. Well, the, you also bring up this very interesting point that, that uh, we talked a little bit earlier about the tension between the theater, say, in the Britain of the 30s, and, or, or it could be America, and, and film is what is serious, what is, what is not. For a, a filmmaker of the accomplishment of Hitchcock, to become involved with television in the way he did was itself a little bit scandalous uh, in, in, in the time. And of course, he's one of the people to perceive exactly what the potential of television was 
at that moment he entered it as well as to, to you, you have to say, see, visionary about its influence upon the culture in the years to come. So uh, he should be given credit in, in that way for bridging all of those those worlds and being adventurous in an extraordinary way. He saw television as being something extraordinary that was going to be lasting and important. And he loved the idea of reaching people in their homes with uh, the stories he had to tell because he was a great storyteller. And uh, John Gilgood was one of the people who talked with me about this difference between being an artist on the stage and being an actor. And he was influenced, and he rather resented a bit the Hitchcock who didn't say, good work, Johnny. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, then later, when I knew him near the end of his life, he said that he was going to be remembered oh, okay. for his work in the Hitchcock films. And it meant so much to him. And his only regret was that all of his performances were gone. Okay. And there was the, the film, and he wished he'd done more. Well, we're filming this today, or uh, shooting it on tape more, mm -hmm. accurate, more accurately, so, so we'll have it. But we have to come to an end now. We've run through our, our 30 minutes. If you'd like more information about City Cinematheque, or more generally about CUNY TV, please come to visit us, no surprise here, in the digital age at our website. Come to www dot c-u-n-y dot t-v. You'll find click on for City Cinematheque and the other programming here at CUNY TV. Again, that website is www dot c-u-n-y dot t-v. Charlotte, always a pleasure to have you here and thanks for bringing 30 minutes. It could be so much more about uh, your experiences with and insights into uh, Hitchcock's marvelous oeuvre. Look forward to having you here again. Thank you. I look forward to it. It went so quickly. I loved being here. Great. Thanks so much. And thank you for joining us today. And I hope you join us once again when we at City Cinema Tech do our best to stroll through the archives, the rich archives of film history. Bye-bye for now. <laughs>